I'm Virginia Murray. I am the CLA for Chapter 9. The opportunity for Chapter 9 was incredible. We had the richness of choosing the examples that Chapters 1 to 8 had requested of us. Each chapter had to have at least chosen an example twice before we were allowed to include it. So you can imagine the excitement in finding, those, finding the examples in the end. But I think we did well. The slide set I'm going to be showing you now comes from the SREX presentation set, which is on their website. So it's very much agreed by them and is a timely presentation of how we've tried to use these case studies. The first thing I really wanted to share with you was the vulnerabilities. So reflecting on what Martin has just been telling you is the vulnerabilities, the exposure, and the events occur around the world. And it was trying to take these examples to turn them into something that would make these, this whole report more accessible. Because it's quite a dense report, it's got a lot of technical information in it, but we want it to be usable, useful, and used. And one of the ways was to use these case studies. Inevitably, the first of the, of the case studies I will share with, with you, after Claire's comments about heat waves and Mark's comments about the complexity of responding to the heat waves, is to share with you this one that happened in France in 2003. In the full report, when it's published in February, you'll see that this particular case study didn't just look at 2003, it looked at the improvement that had occurred by 2006. And I think that was one of the richness of these case studies. We could show where change had occurred. And I think what this one particularly points to is the pre-existing health problems for those who were particularly vulnerable, <coughs> the poverty and the isolation for those people who were particularly affected in <coughs> 2003. We could show that the value of early warning systems was absolutely key to minimize the harm the next time. Even simple things like cooling in public <coughs> places was absolutely essential by 2006. And indeed, much longer term is the changes in urban infrastructure, and possibly including urban green space. The next case study that I'm going to share with you is the one that reflects on drought. Drought is something that I think this year has shown us to be of great concern. And indeed, the drought in West Africa is the one that is shown in this slide. Again, poor health and educational systems are, are key influences on risk factors, besides the lack of rain. But the risk management adaptation solutions include sustainable farming practice and indeed drought resilient crops. Much can be learnt from these very simple techniques and a huge opportunity. Hurricanes is the next case study, and although it didn't come up very high on Claire's chapter three, it's still a huge impact. And part of it relates to population growth in particularly vulnerable places, and that there is a real risk of um, these storm surges with higher waves with the, with the sea level rise. Risk management solutions and adaptation, of course, include early warning systems, which are so key. If we move on to flooding, which Claire has recommended will be more likely to occur, then this example from Nairobi is of particular interest. The risk factors here in Nairobi include the rapid growth of informal settlements, which makes it so much harder to have more resilient buildings in safer places. But also there's real concern about drainage and waste. Again, early warning, key. <coughs> To move to a really real health context event, which I think is very important, and I was so pleased we were able to include it, is to tell the story that occurred in Africa of the largest recorded cholera outbreak in 2008 that occurred in Zimbabwe. Over 4,000 people died, and there was real concern about the risks of the seasonal rains and the impacts upon the population. Obviously, there are many key influences here but it was important to share this in our report. We also looked at vulnerable regions. And of course, permafrost areas in the north are of particular concern. Permafrost requires sub-zero temperatures. That's going to disappear. 
and the effects on road building, on foundations, on airport infrastructure, on many things make sure that this short-term risk reduction won't eliminate the long-term risk. The other example that I'm going to quote just now is managing the risks for small island developing states. There is, of course, shore erosion for many of these vulnerable islands. And, smaller, and also saltwater intrusion, so that damages the water supplies. Again, early warning systems are important, but relocation may be the only solution. The final example I'm going to show you is the one that Martin showed us about Pakistan. Pakistan was not included in full in the report because the evidence base wasn't complete. And so this takes me to what were the lessons identified in this case studies. Research into these events is key, and it's often poorly documented and, sadly, often incomplete. What we did find, though, from this work is that early warning saves life. We all know it, but now we need to implement it much more clearly and really respond when these issues occurred. We also need in place evidence-based disaster risk reduction plans and strategies. These are essential. They've got to be accessible and understood. And for me, as a public health professional, I was really pleased that we were able to show that disaster risk management and public health are so closely linked, they're also almost synchronous. There's so much we can do for the future. Thank you. Thank you, panel.